thank you so much for your wonderful words respect most respected kemlada talesra ma'am most respected wasif sir ushashi ma'am kishori ma'am dr seema tyagi and uh, sarama miss to whom i talked last week all my uh, colleagues of my institution my dear students and all those who are gathered here in this online platform and this uh, expert lecture series is going uh, in a very uh, fantastic manner only because it is being headed by the most uh, creative and uh, the most resourceful the energetic hemlada ma'am she is so loving a loving personality she is and she always uh, wants everything in a in an order and also she tries to discuss lot of academic issues we know we are living in a, a very challenging situation or a world where even academic uh, issues are also taken into consideration each and every day and we have with uh, with us before us the national education policy 2020 and all issues related to it and everything is being uh, discussed in the platform in an academic platform in a group and actually we were uh, i met her when uh, i was in the udaipur conference and from that day onwards we were we are always keeping in touch with related to academic matters and to all those persons who are associated with this academic exercise a warm wish to all of you and let our endeavors be fruitful for the whole society which includes teachers students parents the local uh, the uh, locality members and the society as a whole because we know india is a country where the largest uh, uh, that is uh, not as, uh, as far as the profession wise is concerned teachers are the largest community and we know teaching learning as well as teachers and students should become a life learning lifelong process it should be lifelong process and as a result what will happen is uh, uh, once we enter into this profession or once we were student and now we are teachers and those who have retired from the teaching life and all we are a mixture of all these but we know as lifelong learners we should surely we can surely develop professionally which is the need of the time and as uh, teachers we should not be left behind or as students we should should not be left behind uh, uh, from the society we should become useful members and fruitful members of the society and that should be our main aim and today i am going to present a small topic that it means it is of uh, uh, i thought it as a very interesting because i li like and i love educational psychology it is such an interesting uh, interesting subject and an interesting area or we can say we can always correlate a teaching learning process with education psychology we cannot leave apart education psychology or teach something that in isolation we should always or we will always incorporate or correlate uh, about a majority of the topics from education psychology to our teaching learning process we use it in our classrooms and as teachers we should know what are the needs and the aspirations of the student that is very much needed for which we study educational psychology and once a person asked me why you are trained uh, that is why you are undergoing a b.a program or like that our college professors did not undergo any b.a or training programs like that but they also teach very well isn't it but once a person who is not undertaking a training program and who has done the training program there is a large difference because in uh, the training program we will surely study about how uh, the students behave in the classroom and how we can manage and how teachers are behavioral managers in a classroom and how we can uh, understand the needs and aspirations of the child the problems of the child how far they can uh, what is called uh, accumulate knowledge or accommodate knowledge in their mind and what all mental processes are going on these all should be understood by a 
teacher while he is facing the students because i always say to my students you are facing a group not a file or a machinery or a paper or a equipment but a group of people who are having feelings emotions who are having different ideas who have got a number of doubts is it so you are dealing with human beings so it is the duty of each and every teacher to understand the needs and aspirations of the individual sitting in front of you and also we know as teachers we have got a number of uh, what is called um, uh, some uh, difficulties that is we say i say in difficulties because we are facing a heterogeneous class and as a result what happens is teaching becomes a complex process and we should understand how to tackle with people of different kinds who are sitting in front of us that is our major challenge and as teachers we and as all senior people who are here we i know they are all very much because i know from their actions i know even after they have retired they are still proceeding with the teaching learning process in one way or another that is so much uh, encouraging as far as this community is concerned so with this interesting topic i found it this interesting because i uh, i have to already told you there is some implication of educational psychology in our teaching learning process so we will come to the presentation Hope, hope you can see my screen being shared. Yeah, yeah, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Hope it's visible. Yeah, ma'am. It's visible. Yeah. Can we start. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So my topic is cognitive load theory and individual differences. Already, you might have come across the term cognitive load theory. Those who are interested in psychology or who are dealing with the uh, the papers in psychology will come across surely this term, the cognitive load theory. But how can this be related to individual difference? That is our main concern because I have told you in a classroom situation, classroom practice. individual difference has got a lot of what is called place because we are not facing a homogeneous class uh, we are facing a heterogeneous class there are students who are slow learners maybe fast learners above average students average students below average students gifted learners creative learners students who are having many challenges physically mentally and all and we know there is inclusive education in our classroom taking place and so there is people there are people who are having differences that is one individual is not same as another individual or not alike they are different in different ways such as we know capacity to learn the capability to understand their attitude their aptitude to do something their interest their motivation their curiosity they may be coming from different socio economic background so all these are the differences that we face in a classroom so what is the implication of this theory on individual difference and you will see in this picture the structure of a brain simply uh, uh, drawn and there are three uh, parts uh, that is being uh, illustrated that is one is simply meaning the intrinsic load next one is the extraneous load and the other one is the germane load this i will discuss in detail in my following slides so this is only the uh, to show just the structure of the brain and all the three important factors that are embedded in the cognitive load theory then we'll come to what is actually a cognitive load theory cognitive load from the word itself you can understand that is the amount of information that the working memory can hold at one time so we will have a doubt is there any other memory i have mentioned about working memory so will there be any other memory yes there is another types of memory so 
we should not confuse the CLT. We sometimes often see CLT in some other places. That is, it may be communicative language teaching. But no, here in psychology, it is cognitive load theory. And a systematic study or a research was conducted by John Sweller in 1980s. So it is not a much old theory. But before that, that is before John Sweller has made it significant, there were some uh, discussions going on related to the cognitive load. But as a theory, as a psychological theory, this was actually formulated by John Sweller. And he says that working memory, as I told you, has got limited capacity. That is, you get some information at one time, sometimes you will forget it. Sometimes it will be stored for some time and then you will forget. And there is a relation between but we should not forget certain things isn't it in life we should remember certain things and it should have a long-term memory that is we should remember our name we should remember our date of birth we should remember our wedding anniversary um, or the wedding day or we should remember another person's name so all this should be there in our long-term memory so something which is being sustained for a long period so here comes the relationship between the working and the uh, long term memory. But cognitive load theory always works on the present situation. So which is the present situation? It is the uh, working memory. That is once a topic is taught by the teacher to the student, what happens? He is in the present time. He is listening to the teacher. The teacher may use some visual aids. He is seeing to it to that. And what happens is he is gaining some information that information is being stored in his working memory and once the science period is over next period will be mathematics what will happen whatever he learned in that or heard in that science period will not be retained there then he will go on to the mathematics this process goes on but what will happen if the student wants to learn it ultimately he will shift the information from the working memory to the long-term memory. That is what is happening in our mental process, in our brain. That is why I showed the structure of the brain uh, in the beginning. Now, this is actually a, a structured statement or a definition for the cognitive load theory. That is where you are going to present information to the students. It may be through a number of learning activities. You know, learning experiences and learning activities make the teaching learning process very effective and relevant. And for what is, why are we using these activities? Why? Because whatever be the subject, there will be a minimal level of activity in the classroom. That activity will help the students to optimize their intellectual performance. That is, students will be led to a higher level where the students gain information all the five senses become active that much knowledge will enter into the mind and that will help them to lead to a intellectual or optimized intellectual performance and what is happening in their mind information processing that is they have gathered a number of information you know when you want to when you go for googling that is you want to, you are going to search something you will get one lakh twenty thousand results but only certain things are needed. And for that, what you will do, you are trying to organize things that is uh, be specific. What you want to know only you will uh, keep back and the other, words, other things you will all delete, is it? So all types of information will enter into the mind of the students. And all, through the mental processes of what is happening, there is information processing taking place. And through this information processing, what will happen is the students will accept only what he needs for his for learning his topic for learning his school subjects is there and the rest he will discard this process goes on in his mind and he will make use of the schema that is already existing information is stored in the schema and what will happen is he will relate this to the new knowledge he has got some past knowledge in his memory and that will be related to or a link will be formed between the past experiences and the new experiences which will help him to analyze the uh, uh, analyze the whole process the whole topic or the whole problem and he is going to try to find out a solution to the problem and we'll come to the information i have told you about this information processing so 
there is uh, a model of teaching in our uh, or uh, uh, in our subject that is in our training program you know that is a model which belongs to the information processing family that is the most important or the biggest family which has a number of members and lot of models are there so this is just the uh, uh, schematic representation of the information processing model where you come across the three memories one is the sensory memory the other one is the working memory and the other one is long term memory the third one so what is actually the sensory memory and what is actually done, uh, what is being done in the sensory memory that is information is taken by the sensory receptors and that is being uh, processed by the nervous system and information is stored so uh, for example if you uh, step out of your house and you see a dog so immediately that will be processed in your nervous system and you will identify it as a dog or something you feel under your ch chair you will see something under your chair so what is happening there is the sensory memory is becoming active where you when once you see it it will be immediately store uh, processed by the nervous system and that information will be stored and then it will be transformed transferred to the next memory and also uh, we see that certain things which we see will be or we smell sometimes some cooking is done in the kitchen and we will get good smell is it here also the senses are becoming active and that will be uh, processed by the nervous system and will be stored as a memory but certain in certain situations it will be forgotten certain at certain times and then you will shift this uh, whatever you have stored in the sensory memory to the working memory so here comes the importance of the working memory but there is a limitation in working memory as psychologists say that it can hold only certain amount of information or we can say it is only uh, working temporarily that is on the spot sometimes it will work on the spot only and then what will happen is it will be forgotten and but if you do the same thing one more than once what will happen it will retain it will be retained in the memory and then the most important aspect in a uh, life or also in our learning process or in a teaching process of whatever action we do the long term memory is very much important why because here the memory is being sustained or it is stored indefinitely and we know that is uh, reasoning then the skill of thinking skill of doing something solving a numerical problem while you solve a numerical problem there are a number of steps and you are remembering those steps one after the other you are going to do it you are going to do some cooking in the kitchen and you know what is uh, uh, actually needed what all ingredients are uh, are to be are to be added and what all steps are to be followed in cooking is it that is uh, that we always uh, do the same thing repeatedly why because it, those steps are being uh, stored in the long term memory and it is indefinite and we will remember i have told you already we we will remember what uh, what is our name or what is the uh, what are the life uh, the skills which we have uh, gathered when we were or developed when we entered into a job that may be some 25 years back but what are skills we developed at that time and as students they can understand what they have learned the, when they were in the first standard why they still remember because it is in the long term memory these are all things we know and uh, the most important aspect here is i am going to highlight is this implication on individual difference so why is this uh, cognitive load theory considered as a psychological theory because you know once we get a new information what process is being going on we know this there are some uh, changes going on in our cognitive structure we know as we gather some information or new information is being uh, accessed by us so it is being considered as a psychological theory only because it attempts to explain the psychological or the behavioral phenomena resulting from instruction so we always say there is a change in the behavior of the student not in the way they behave in the classroom but what type of behavior once they enter into the classroom they did not know or they did not know the solution to a problem or they do not know uh, what is going uh, what is uh, meant by a new topic what is a new topic is being taught in the classroom they do not know anything zero behavior 
and once they leave the class after 40 minutes or one hour one and a half half hour session their behavior will be changed so some behavioral change is being taken place and that behavioral change leads to a psychological theory so cognitive load theory has got a psychological construct and there is an observable phenomena we know there will be a lot of change taking place in the minds of the student as well as in his behavior that is he has accumulated large amount of knowledge and that knowledge which he has gained will be helpful for him to apply it in his life situation the all the things which he has learned in the classroom has got a number of implications in his uh, future life in his uh, life in at home in his society he can what is called uh, understand the needs of the society he can solve the problems of the society so that all changes or the behavioral changes took place in the classroom because he has gathered information so that is why it is called a psychological theory and here as teacher the objective of cognitive load theory as teachers you should understand what is the architecture of the human cognitive structure that is we cannot give a number of things to this child at a time because they say that there is a limited capacity i told you the working memory has got a limited capacity and it will not accept anything beyond that that brain becomes full and it will not accept now what will happen that um, memory that is the working memory all things that are stored there should be transferred to which one to the long term memory then that working memory space will be there then you are going to add more and more things isn't it so this process should be going on and as a teacher a teacher should understand what, how the brain functions and what are the capabilities and limitations of the human cognitive architecture and also they should know that is the working memory is something tempor temporarily arranged it has got limited capacity and uh, it is uh, very easy to overload that is the more and more things if you provide it to them what will happen it will be overloaded and you know certain machinery will stop working if it is overloaded isn't it so we will try to repair it either we will uh, uh, remove the content contents from it or we will try to repair same repair is needed in our human brain too and also this should be understood by a teacher when providing new information to the students so here comes the difference the capacity to learn the capability to learn depends upon each and every individual so that is why a teacher should understand the child first understand their uh, how the brain works and uh, once he categorizes the children into slow learners or fast learners or uh, what is called uh, uh, above average or below average students they will the teachers should understand how the brain functions as a result he can provide information to the students in such a way and here comes the cognitive load divided into three types i have told you already the intrinsic load what is intrinsic load intrinsic load is the complexity of the new information provided to the students so once he enters the class he is going to learn something new so when he learns something new what is happening in, is that he finds that it as a problem why he finds it as a problem because that solution to that is not known so whatever situation or whichever situation whose solution is not known is a problem for us is it so as far as students are concerned they will be in a disequilibrium state disequilibrium means the solution is not known so once the teacher provides the information in a systematic way with the help of a number of facilities or activities the solution becomes clear to them as a result they become in an equilibrium state or they reach the equilibrium state and as human beings we cannot remain in the disequilibrium state for a long time these are all psychological theories okay so what is happening in intrinsic load is in intrinsic load new information is being provided to the students and as far as students are concerned it is complex why because it is something new and they should be accustomed with the situation so that is what is called the intrinsic load what will be uh, mentioned in extraneous load is all the uh, unnecessary things sometimes you know i have told you when you start googling what will happen is 
a number of unnecessary things also come into uh, that place, isn't it? Uh, because we have sometimes we have searched climatic conditions of a particular place. What will happen? Wherever the uh, term climate is being uh, uh, mentioned, in wherever whatever literature, all those things will come there. So we will have, we will be in a puzzled situation. We in the middle and one lakh twenty thousand results in uh, around us. What which what should we do? So these are the extra things which are unnecessary things which we are uh, in the midst of. So similarly, certain situations when we are providing some unnecessary information that will overload the memory of the students. So teachers should try to be specific. And you know, for making it specific, you get bring you can bring certain factors such as uh, you go from we use the principles of teaching that is go from simple to complex or from known to unknown, or you correlate one subject with another subject, or you provide what is called some concept mapping or some mapping is being done in their minds. And what happens there is they will become specific. And whatever unnecessary things which are not related to the topic or to the subject matter can be discarded. But if you included all these things, what will happen is it becomes an extraneous load. And that will again uh, reduce the efficiency of the memory. And last one is the germane load, which is very much needed. That is, you are going to gather new information which is related to the current information. You know, students have got a particular base. That is, uh, they know certain things. And all these certain things only you are going to add more and more information. So what will happen to the students is they will try to link the past information with the present one. Okay. And that becomes, uh, that makes learning permanent. And that will be retained in the memory for a long time. So germane load is something which is very much needed, which can relate the current information with the new information. So I will show this as a uh, as diagrammatic representation. That is, you should manage, you should be able to manage the intrinsic load. That is, the complexity of the new information that you can provide to the students. That is, that uh, also the teacher should understand that student at the present situation is having a working memory that working memory is something which is uh, which has got certain limitation and once you overload it you cannot uh, ask the students to accumulate more and more information so as a teacher you should be able to manage the intrinsic load and minimize as much as possible the extraneous load but as teachers we know we will certain we will uh, uh, while we are taking classes or while we are interacting with the students what is happening is we all uh, we uh, pour uh, pour in lot of information which are irrelevant also. Why? Because uh, because we are interested in lot of talking and lot of the things during um, related to some uh, other things indirectly related to other things. All the experiences which we have which we had or, or the, we are going to share experiences of others. Everything will be included. Students will be confused. Which one to choose? Which is more specific? Which one should be uh, what is called um, inculcated to our memory? So the students will be confused. So try to minimize the extraneous load, but maximize the germane load where you are going to uh, yeah, link the new information with the current information. Just a diagrammatic representation to show how to manage things, what all to be minimized and what all to be maximized. And we know working memory is something I have told you. Uh, when we pour information into the working memory, what will happen is there is a lot of chances to forget. It will not be retained in our memory for a long time. And we will forget. And the students will think, uh, what uh, to uh, from uh, where should I recall it? Uh, there is nothing uh, in that memory to be recalled, isn't it? It will be remembered. So try to avoid such these things and try to shift, ask the student uh, that is uh, try to or give some time for the students to shift their mem uh, memory from the um, uh, working memory to the long term memory which is very much needed especially in our present situation when we know we are in an online platform and the student uh, teachers are running uh, from here and there to teach the students in whatever manner they can they use a number of technological tools and the students, because they are not seeing the 
physical presence. There is no physical presence of the teacher there. The teacher is sitting somewhere and the students are in some remote places. And the physical, since there is no physical presence, the teacher also cannot understand whether the students have understood because they are not seeing the students all the time. So these are all some challenges that is going on now in the online platform situation. And also uh, the teachers should now be more aware that pouring a lot of, of information will do no good to the students because it will not be retained in the working memory. Everything will be lost after some time unless it is being shifted to our long term memory. Now here comes the focus on individual difference because cognitive load theory focuses on individuals rather than group learning. We always say about Lay Vygotsky's kids social uh, learning that is social uh, constructivism and all that is he always says that he always said that no student can learn in isolation. He will learn only if he's in a social setting. That is, he should be uh, entering into an interaction with the society, with the students in the group or in a classroom or outside the class. But here, this theory mainly focuses on individuals because individual attention is to be given. So here comes the uh, importance of individual differences. And I have already told you, no two individuals are alike. Because one person sits with another person near to him, they two are not at all alike. They are um, different in different aspects. So we are focusing on this theory with uh, individual differences. Now, when we think of individual differences, we always say why they are different because their attitude is different. I have already told you their attitude is different then their learning styles are different then uh, the personality or their emotional intelligence is different or uh, their behavior is different or we can say uh, they have different interests they are motivated differently uh, one will be less curious one will be more curious isn't it so these are the general thinking when we come across individual differences but when we deal with or when we are relating with cognitive load theory we should understand one more thing that is it is being highlighted, the context, uh, the individual difference context is being highlighted mainly on these three things, such as their cognitive abilities, which includes the cognitive control, their prior knowledge, which is very much important, and the self-regulation skills. And I'm going to highlight these three things with re uh, uh, re in relation to the cognitive load theory. So I'm going to highlight these three contexts of an individual difference based on the cognitive abilities, that is the cognitive, uh, what is called a control. And all these three things, when you go across, we come, uh, we see that it is, um, ha it is a member or it is a part of the information processing model, which I have told you. That is, all the information processing is being highlighted through three, these three uh, contexts or these three components, such as the cognitive abilities, the prior knowledge and the self-regulation skills. So here we can highlight the individual difference based on these three things. Now, in a heterogeneous class, we say that always there are a lot of concerns, but the needs of the individual difference are not looked into because what is the, uh, what is called a comfortable position of a teacher is, he always considers the class as an average class. The below average or the above average students are not looked into or their problems or their needs are not being uh, satisfied or it is not a concern or it will, it will not be a concern to the teacher for a large extent. What is happening there is because the teacher feels comfortable with average students. So what will happen to the below average students and the above average students? And there are people who like to um, who are of different characteristics. That is, uh, their learning styles will be different. Some will be uh, interested on pictorial illustrations and all. Some will learn more through use of pictures and all. But some are interested in use of words. And some will uh, like visual representations. Some will like auditory representations. And some will like, uh, are interested in more the lightings uh, than what all the different uh, animations, the sound, then the, what all illustrations on a poster rather than a chart. And some will uh, like uh, what is called um, verbal 
and spatial ability. I am stressing my topic on spatial ability. So all these are the differences that are that are seen among individuals. So this is a concern of a heterogeneous class. So as to, as a teacher, the teacher should be able to uh, find out a solution to face uh, what is the to help the students achieve their needs, achieve uh, the what is the differences that are being uh, being met in the classroom. And so it is a what is called a complex becoming a complex process. And so when we come to the spatial abilities, that is I am highlighting, it is related to the three factors such as uh, the process of generating, retaining and manipulating visual images. That is certain students, when they see a picture, what will happen is they will imagine and they will make a number of relationships and there will be divergent thinking. Thinking uh, will be in a different way, not like an ordinary uh, people think. They will think in a different way and they will find out the unusual relationships among the uh, components of the picture and they will come to a solution which will be something different and they will visualize in a different way. They will manipulate the visual patterns and they will form certain mental images. So all these are being done in their mind. So they will create something new or they will imagine and visualize. This is a uh, thing or this is the most important thing that is being that is needed in a teaching learning process. And we always forget uh, as teachers, we forget these things that is um, making the students reach the highest level beyond that level. The student cannot think about that particular topic. So that is why uh, our, um, more added domain was being introduced in the taxonomy of objectives, which is being listed in our teaching learning process. That is called create. That is the students should create patterns, relationships. They should imagine, they should visualize. So that is the highest order of thinking, which is being uh, delivered in a class or which, which is being possible in a classroom. And as teachers, teachers should help the students reach that top level. So how many teachers are doing it in our classroom? Because they feel that no student sitting in front of me can reach at that level. But only if uh, uh, what is called situations or facilities are provided uh, uh, or uh, situations are made suitable for them, will only they will be able to reach that highest level. So this is the highest level of the cognitive ability which a student can develop. That is the spatial abilities. So. A number of studies are being conducted based on the relationship between what is called individual difference, cognitive load, and the spatial abilities. So there is a relationship. And here, what is happening is the more the spatial ability of a student. So here comes more. I have told you more. So there are possibilities of less spatial ability. So here comes the individual difference. There are students who are having more spatial ability what will happen is that they will they can accommodate as much as uh, what is called information as possible so the cognitive load is being dependent on the spatial ability and that is one part of an individual difference so the less the uh, spatial ability that much cognitive load only can be accommod accommodated to them and better performance so that result in better performance and you always say that students perform better. Why? Because certain students, not all the students. Why? Because there is individual difference. And those individuals and the students who have high spatial ability can accommodate a lot of load, the cognitive load. And that will lead to better performance when compared to. Now we here we use a term called the visual spatial experience or visual spatial skill. What is visual spatial skill? It is the ability to tell where the objects are arranged in space. That is, uh, that is uh, where such and such things are being arranged. Or we know uh, where the things are being arranged or whether how, it, how far it is from you or how far it is from each other. And that skill that is something it, uh, that is uh, always we deliberately come across. That is where the things are being arranged. So that type of skill is being developed in such students. That is visual spatial 
arrangement or skills. And a student who has having lower spatial ability will not be able to process the cognitive load materials deeply. And what will happen? That will lead to poor performance. So this is how a lot of studies are being conducted and the results are very systematically being expressed. That is the relation between individual difference, the cognitive load and the spatial abilities. And again, I have told you in this context, I am giving importance to the cognitive abilities, then the spatial abilities and the prior knowledge. And again, we say that self-regulation skills have got a very much a very important place in cognitive load theory. What are self-regulation skills? That is, this is a very important term which a teacher should understand. The self-regulation skills are skills that allows the students to control their emotions, control their behaviors, and even the body movement. And which is being, uh, we know that being uh, this is being different in different people. That is how they face tough situations. For example, if you notice each and every child before you, certain students uh, are sitting in so tense the way. Why? Because they cannot pay attention or focus on anything new for a long time. Why? Because that person, the self-regulation skill is low. That is, they are not in a position to manage the behavior or their interaction with another, they will outburst immediately because they cannot manage their emotions or their behaviors. They cannot pay attention or stay glued to uh, or stay focused to something new. You are going to teach a new thing. The student will ultimately get tense. Oh, how can I manage the situation? Whether I will be able to remain for a long time before uh, to gra uh, grasp this new information. So once he becomes focused, what will happen? He will be tense. And what will he do? He will not be able to manage his emotions. He will sometimes outburst in the classroom. So that is, so you will have a doubt. How the self-regulation skills have got a place in the prior knowledge? Or we always say entry behavior or previous knowledge. Is there any relationship between self-regulation skills and prior knowledge? Yes. And the more prior knowledge you have, that is because we know the learners have different levels of prior knowledge. Why? Because, you know, that also again depends upon the individual difference. That is, some students will gather a lot of information. That will act as a prior knowledge to them. Once they have a strong prior knowledge, what will happen is they can always relate it with the new knowledge. And also, you know, individual differences have different learning strategies. Some will take long time to gather a small piece of information. But certain people will take only few uh, time or small time to gather large information. So that's the opposite. So they have some people who have got a lot of prior knowledge. What will they have? What will they do is they will immediately relate it with the new information. Okay, and they will be satisfied, they will be comfortable. That is what is happening. So, prior knowledge is a very important determinant of individual difference. So, that the, here comes the relationship between prior knowledge and self regulation skills. So, higher the prior knowledge, effective will be the self regulation skills. Why? Because they know how to regulate their own learning, and also that helps them to maintain a balance they will not immediately outburst or they will not become uh, what you know, um, um, what we call uh, uh, show their emotions immediately or uh, they will be, they can focus or they can uh, what is called uh, pay attention to a class. Even if it uh, prolongs, they can remain there and there, there will be no much problem in maintaining a balance or uh, in maintaining a good relation with others or interacting with others. And that will ultimately help them to make their working memory effective. So what happens to the other group of people whose prior knowledge is not high? What will happen? Their self-regulation skills, they will be more engaged in maintaining their emotions instead of gathering information. They will remain tense. That is, uh, and in between that tense situation, they will get some knowledge. So what will happen? Their working memory will not function properly and i have told you working memory is something which is uh, which is temporary 
which is not long term as a result the working memory is the present memory in which the student is gaining information when the teacher is deliberately giving the information the students will grasp it and if the students who are balanced the remaining balanced with a high prior knowledge and high efficient self regulatory skills what will happen is they can make the working memory more efficient so here comes the duty of a teacher what should a teacher do so there is a general finding or we can say i write it in the form of an equation that is this how this cognitive load theory is being applied in the classroom teachers should always uh, that is uh, feel that whatever he is giving the new information in the form of uh, intrinsic cognitive load and all other extra unnecessary things which he are providing in the classroom will ultimately form what is called the overloaded working memory that the teacher should always remember so he should be specific he should choose what should i give to the students and how these materials can be presented in a very effective manner to the students because no two individuals are alike and i am always facing a heterogeneous class so he should always all teachers should remember this equation that is the increase of intrinsic cognitive load plus increase so both are increase so uh, both are in the highest level when it is being provided to the students what will happen it will cause an overload so here comes a solution to the problem that is that is how to maximize student learning by minimizing the gap that exists among the difference among the individuals that is there the gap should not be big made big it should be minimized and also each and every student that is whatever we deliver should uh, what is called uh, reach in equal frequencies to the uh, student and maximize student learning all the, there are uh, almost seven strategies that can be adopted in the classroom first one is and it is called different is known in the name of different effects such as the element interactivity effect what does that mean that is here the teacher should understand the existing knowledge and skill of the students that is a very much uh, what is a, a, a what is called a, a prior knowledge which the teacher should have the teacher should have he should not go off hand and uh, post some information to the students and come back and relax no he should study the uh, what is called the composition of each and every student how his brain will work and he should do uh, so as a result the teacher should do a lot of homework and for that he should understand the skills the competencies the existing knowledge of the students and should tailor according to the needs that is for one student it will be in one way for the other student it will be in another way and here comes the importance of self learning practices so individual or what is called personalized system of learning that can be done in the classroom but can it be done in a uh, in our situation when we talk about indian situation we are always look to our developed countries and always compare the education system of the developed countries what is happening there there uh, we say that our whole education system is okay why because the teacher pupil ratio is very small and there are a lot of facilities attached to a classroom but is the is it the same situation in our rural areas or the urban areas in our country no but teachers are taking a lot of effort to understand the child and that is why there was a shift from the product uh, type of uh, learning teaching learning to the process type where you give importance to the student shift from the teacher dominated to the student centered learning and importance is given to the child and when importance is given to the child what happens to the teacher the role of the teacher is different he becomes a social engineer he becomes a knowledge worker he becomes a facilitator and now he is going to facilitate learning in the classroom and what is happening there he is going to tailor the lessons according to the students needs existing knowledge and the skill and second strategy is worked example effect what is happening there is here you are work using worked examples to teach the students new content so what are worked examples that is actually the uh, on the spot the examples or on the spot activities that you can show for the students before the students what will happen what will happen is that 
they will get a direct purposeful experience and you what is called you lecture about a rose flower in the classroom for 2 hours what will happen the students will retain something and the everything other things will be lost because the working memory is not uh, is a temporary one but if you bring the original thing if you can bring an original thing some worked examples in the classroom what will happen the whatever they have learned will be immediately shifted to the long term memory and that will be retained for a long years or it will be retained indefinitely so that is this effect that is worked example effect where you, where you can provide opportunities for the students to work on or the teacher being demonstrate showing there some demonstrations in the classroom next strategy is expertise reversal effect and you always now think about the we are always saying about now the reverse quarantine and quarantine then reverse quarantine isn't it now what is happening in expertise reverse reversal effect is here you increase gradually the independent problem solving as students become that is what is happening is you provide a situation in the classroom a problematic situation in the classroom and ask the students to solve it with their own effort here the teacher becomes a mentor takes a different role he becomes a mentor or a guide and the student with the available facilities and with the motivation of the teacher will solve the problem let it be a small one then you ask the, them to go to a complex one going from simple to complex and once you feel that the student is proficient in solving the problem you remove your scaffolding or you remove your what is called your help and this teach student becomes a what is called a problem solver he will be applying all the knowledge or the experience which he has gained in that situation to a new situation in solving other problems so that is again a very important effect that can be used in a classroom now what i have seen in uh, developed countries is that he, there the students are divided into small groups and if a certain child is having in some difficulty in learning the other students will be prompted or encouraged to choose such students who are having difficulty and form a group and the teachers say and the education system or the grading system in such a way the more difficult students they uh, join in a group or they encourage to join them in a group the more grades that group will get so what the students do is they are going on finding out students who are having difficulty in learning or who are slow learners or who are having some uh, diff, uh, challenges and they will uh, include them in that group and that group will gain the most or the maximum grade so can't we apply such a situation in our indian context also that is the grading we are not uh, giving importance to such type of grading system so what will happen is the people who are having uh, difficulties or are uh, very slow in learning they can, they are also benefited and even the peers who will help them also will be automatically benefited so this is a type of uh, what is called the expertise reversal effect and next strategy is the redundancy effect where you cut out the inessential information i have told you the external load try to uh, avoid the external load or minimize it because that will only overload it overload the memory of the students so try to cut short or make more specific or provided what is necessary and once the students are motivated you go and gather information more if you are interested they will be uh, trying to gather information once they leave the class or once they are sitting idle if they are interested or if they are having that attitude or the temper they will be able to uh, what is called uh, gather information if they wish otherwise try to cut out the inessential information next strategy is the split attention effect where present all the essential information together what is here we give a whole picture we say that about the gestaltic view and all that is provide the whole picture whole view about what essential things or essential information now i am going to pass it to you 
so give a uh, whole idea or whole picture put it together and the students what they will think is they will according to their mental capacity they will try to break into small pieces and analyze it or they will try to gather it so that is the split attention effect next effect is the modality effect where you can simplify the information both orally and visually i have told you certain students are interested in seeing visual representations pictorial representations or illustrations pictures photographs etc diagrams and all so what a teacher should do is try to uh, uh, not to stick only to the oral technique even though it is comfortable stick on to other uh, uh, other experiences also such as to make the students open their or add, make the uh, uh, senses active so that more information can pour into uh, into uh, their or uh, into their mind and all uh, what is called they can gather information in a very effective manner and the last strategy you can add now as creative teachers and as uh, what are called uh, as a, a very what is social responsible citizens you can add more strategies the imagination effect where i have told you help the students reach that effect or that level where they cannot think beyond so where the students can visualize the concepts and procedures here comes the importance of forming the groups and we always say that uh, forming homogeneous groups among a heterogeneous classroom is very comfortable for the teacher but what will happen to the homogeneous groups the more uh, elite groups will perform better the other homogeneous group which are very dull or which are not uh, coming up to the standard of the average level what will happen they will always lag behind so here we can copy the what all things are going on in the developed countries include a uh, few students who are dull or what is called who are slow learners or who are having difficulties in an elite group and make them also become elite that is and help them to all the members of the group to reach a um, highest level where can they can visualize where they can imagine where they can form relationships concepts where they can divergently think and all these all possible things can be made in the classroom so these are few strategies you can again add more to it and here comes which strategy can i adopt whether i will adopt strategy 1 okay now i will adopt strategy 1 and find that okay it is good then i will relate it with or i we can uh, what is called link it with other strategies link all the strategies together sometimes you know in a classroom we are using a combination of different things is there combination of different things that is because not only make the class exciting but also you can provide a vivid experience to the child so try to combine all these things for what what is the ultimate aim to optimize their learning optimize the perf performance academic performance or optimize the learning experiences that can be uh, obtained by the students and uh, make the working memory being optimized so that it will not be completely lost they can retain it for some time till it is being shifted or transferred to the long term memory so that should be the aim of each and every teaching learning process so you can adopt any strategy or you can link all these strategies together and find that something will be simple and the other will be complex so let it be but you can bring a vivid or number of strategies or a combination of strategies in the classroom so this is my uh, um, request to all of you who are present in this group and all those who are becoming going to become prospective teachers in future they also can apply this theory in the classroom so as a conclusion i can say that this has become a very important part of educational psychology and as considered as a psychological theory because why only because it has got a strong base lot of researches are being uh, done uh, high quality experimental research is being done in this field and it is being widely used not only for uh, solving complex uh, uh, environments or so the problem solving environments but also now we can apply it when we use the multimedia learning the online learning platforms when we use a number of technological devices when we are going to make a blended learning in future you know we are coming across blended learning 40% age will be 
online, the 60 percentage remain offline. So whatever be the uh, situation, whatever be the environment, try to understand the architecture of the human brain and the different types of memories and the consider this cognitive load theory as a psychological theory and the teachers be specific and to the point and try to uh, uh, minimize the extraneous load and give the internist intrinsic cognitive load and the germane load as maximize maximize it only for the ultimate aim that is for high level performance of the child and high level what is called a efficient working memory and we can say a high level a high level experience that can be provided to the child so that the children the students are made useful and what is called a um, relevant uh, what is called uh, an important citizen because we know only once they understand the society solve understand the needs of the society and solve the problems of the society can they become responsible and useful citizens of our country so let this be the aim of our teachers always reflect on your uh, on your actions once you have done one job even if it is uh, cooking or even if it is teaching whatever action you do reflect on it what are modifications can be made what all theories can be applied and then make it more and more uh, what is called uh, efficient modified versions will come in the coming days make it more uh, what is called uh, polished than the uh, what is called what you have used in the past make it uh, very much uh, effective that it, it is useful for the society as a whole which includes as i told you parents the locality the students your colleagues and all so let this be the motto of all who are present here thank you and thank you so much for giving me such a wonderful opportunity to present before you a small thought of mine thank you